hard to pivot from always like competing in different countries, different cities, different facilities? How do you mentally adjust to that? Um, I think it takes a toll on you mm. um, because you're just always on a plane. Like you never get to sleep in your own bed. Um, but at the same time, it's such a nice experience. Um, it's so nice just being um, being able to learn different stuff about different cultures and being yeah. able to see, you know, how things are in different places of the world. Um, but it takes a toll on you towards, you know, yeah. the end of the year or the tournament and stuff. You're ready to kind of go home and see your family. <laughs> so it's an adjustment. Yeah. And do you guys see common themes between sports and business? I mean, you're now all in the business world. What is some something common that you've that's translated from your sporting world to your business world now? Yeah, I think that sense of competition has always stayed the mm. same for me, right? Like. Um, there was a book that Tiger wrote a long time ago when I was first getting into the sport where he, um, for anyone who's a fan of the GOAT, um, his first Masters win, uh, he won by 12 and it was, a, it was a record at the time and he talks about how when he came through the front nine, um, he knew that he was going to win and he says, I want to finish in style. Oh. Um, and so that sort of stuck with me through my golf career and that, um, especially in match play, you know, get out on the golf course and get off as fast as can I, as fast as I can. I wanted to dominate my opponent, right? Mm. And I think when I think through my business career, um, particularly in sales, right, you get quotas and metrics and goals for the year. And for me, it's not always about just hitting those goals, but uh, exceeding them. Okay. Um, and so that sense of competition, you know, predominantly within myself has definitely mm. stayed through my golf career, but then also my business life yeah. as well. It's not enough to win. You gotta win like exactly. with style. Exactly. And, like, yeah. Exceed it totally, right? Yep. I love that. Love that. What about you, Chris? For What's me, carried over? I would say the biggest thing is just uh, the team structure. Mm. And this actually took me, a, I would say, a little while to really realize it. But on a team, you have a head coach, assistant coaches, you have players, and everyone has their own role. Yeah. I went into business, and at first, I tried to be all of them. And you find out really quickly that you can't really grow, you can't really scale if you're trying to play every position. So a business is the same thing as a team. You need that structure, you need those processes, you need those players to play each role as well. Yeah. And once you start looking at, like, at it like that, you're like, wow, this is literally the same thing as my locker room. Mm. And so it's pretty cool when you finally start to realize how similar it really is as a business owner myself. And at that point, once I realized that and we started building those processes and those teams, that's when we really started taking off. And I guess that's when everyone's strengths shine, right? And then we're versus working on our weaknesses, just leverage everyone's strengths. Absolutely. Mm. Just, just like a team. I mean, Got guys it. have their own positions. They're skilled in a certain thing. And it's the same thing with the business. You want to put the people in the right place to be successful. Absolutely. And you, Arena, what do you think in I terms of translation to a business world? I think organization, just like being super organized. Mm -hmm. um, it's so big for me, especially like these days, we're working from home and everything. You just have to make sure that you're very organized. Yeah. Um, and you know, with tennis, you have so much discipline, like you have to be in time and everything that, you know, pretty much with every sport, you have to be on time and make sure that you get your practice done and make sure you do your best. So I think just being organized to where I make sure my time is perfectly, um, like just structure to where I can get my work done and then at the same time like you know get my rest and everything I think that's a, a big thing that I carried with me. I love that. From winning to style to team to structure <laughs> we can definitely learn a lot from that into business. Um, what about challenges right when you, you you alluded to a bit of that at the beginning as well Natasha like when you transitioned into business world you stopped touring after three years like what when do you know it's time to move on? At what point do you say, okay, I'm ready for the next chapter? Yeah, I think, I think for me it was, um, you know, I'd played this for so long um, mm -hmm. and it was a game that I was super passionate about and, and really loved with all of my heart. And I think when I was in tournament play, um, and wasn't getting the results that I wanted to, um, that really messed with me, you know, mentally, I think, mm -hmm. right? Like, uh, it, I knew that it wasn't a case of skill or talent. Um, it definitely was in my head. And so when I realized that I was starting to get very angry at a sport mm -hmm. that I'd loved for so long, I needed mm -hmm. to take a step back and, and give myself a break um, and make sure that, you know, I was going to be okay. So 
I think, you know, at that time I, um, I just, you know, graduated college. I was living on my own now, um, and I needed to be able to take care of myself financially. And that was the point where, um, because I, I think mentally was having a hard time, I said, you know, it's, it's time to maybe make a move and, mm. and try something else and make sure that I can still succeed in life without just golf on my resume. Absolutely. And that I know a lot of you folks on, especially on LinkedIn, are corporate professionals, and some of you are looking at transitioning your career. I love that fact that you mentioned about like just kind of almost like self-awareness, right? Knowing yeah. that mentally it wasn't serving you or bringing you that joy anymore and, and moving on. And do, let us know if you identify with that. For those of you that are transitioning from one career to the next, or even for those of you tuning in that are transitioning from athletics to business, let us know what that's been like for you on your journey and in the comments below. And um, we actually have a, um, oh, I see Matthew in there. He's like, you got to win with style. <laughs> <laughs> You're being quoted, Natasha. There you go. Uh, and for you, Chris, um, you know, when did you know? What was that pivotal point in your career uh, to make the change? Unfortunately for a lot of players, it's when you get hurt. Mm. Uh, so I did, got, a, got hurt in camp, training camp, took an injury settlement, tried coming back, ran a 40-yard dash, ruptured my hamstring, and at that point it was either have surgery, get it repaired, or just move on. Right. Um, I think you also know kind of when that, that passion fades a mm. little bit. So when you don't have that desire where you're like, man, I got to get out there, I really want to be there. You know, if you're not all in, that's kind of when you know it's yeah. time to go to the next, the next stage because as a pro, you have to be all in. You have to be 100% in. You have to be on the top of your game, or you're not going to win, and you're going to, you know, you're going to be cut anyways, or you're just not going to have a good season. So uh, at that point, I was four years in. It was a beatdown. It was kind of that point where it was like, all right, I, do I really want to do this still? Right. And the second you start getting those second thoughts, that's ah. when it's it's time to go, time to move on. Do you find that that passion is the thing that carries you through through the tough times? That's what got me there in the first place, for mm -hmm. sure. That that passion gets you there. That's the only way you get to that stage, to that level. That's the only way you push yourself that far. And once that fades, you, you just can't, you can't push yourself like that anymore. Got it. Irina, how did you make that transition? How did you say, okay, I'm not gonna continue. I'm gonna totally pivot. Cause it's a big pivot, right? It is, that's true. Um, I have to agree with Chris because mine was two big injuries that one on my shoulder that kind of took back, took me back to where I can play that well, just like Natasha was saying. Um, when you realize, like, you know, is you get to a point that you can't really support yourself financially anymore and then your body's hurting, mm -hmm. you just you just realize it's, it's just time to go. Plus, with the mental part, I think since I played since I was so young and my teenage years, I was always on the road. It kind of gets to your to your head to where you're like, OK, I'm kind of burnt out right now and then mm -hmm. my body is not helping me either. So it was a combination of stuff. It was sad. It was sad. Yeah. But. You know, you got to do what you got to do. That's part of the sport as well. Mm -hmm. For sure. We have a question from the audience, David Ball. I know David is a huge marathoner. Um, he asks, what different industries and jobs can your athletic background translate into best? Oh, maybe we can do a quick round here. So for other golfers, let's say, <laughs> Have you found that some of your peers from your golfing days, did they land in certain industries or? Yeah, no, businesses? I would say it's been a total mix. I wouldn't hmm. say that there's one in particular. Um, what I would say though, is the, the skills and the experience that you um, acquire over playing you know, elite athlete, um, athletics, that, that contributes everywhere that you go outside of it, right? So I don't think that there's one necessarily um, industry per se, but mm. the skills definitely translate. Absolutely. Have you found that, Chris? How how is your sporting peers? I would say I've seen a lot of guys go into law enforcement. Oh. I think it's kind of that team feel uh, when it. you go into law enforcement. I see a lot of guys do sales, medical sales seems to be a big one. Uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of what I've noticed out of my teammates. But I think a lot of it with with law enforcement is just they miss that locker room feel, they miss mm. that team feel, and that's how the and why the guys kind of and the structure too follow that right? for sure yeah and you tennis um, to 
Any similar industries that you've seen? Pickleball. <laughs> <laughs> yes. For sure. I'm a pickleball <laughs> pro, right? <laughs> Which is so funny because a lot of my uh, friends or, you know, tennis partners in, <laughs> with, uh -huh. um, throughout the years, they all join like pickleball leagues, which, and they're playing professionally now, which I oh, have wow. no idea it's actually a oh. thing these days. Um, but I would say that, you know, a lot of people just kind of transition to different industries. It's not something really set. Um, tennis, a, it's a very individual sport, so mm -hmm. you, you, and you play in a team somewhat during college, but you kind of adjust to whatever, like, you know, you just, you know that you need to make it on your own. So, you know, people just join all different types of industries. So we just need to find like a, a pickleball equivalent for all the other sports, right? <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> From one pro to the next. Yeah. Well, as we go into the next section, I wanted to play for you guys a video of our very own Chris Gronkowski oh, here we go. <laughs> speaking of entrepreneurship and business. Um, this is a segment from his Shark Tank uh, guest appearance. When, what year was that, Chris? So we're coming up on the fifth anniversary. That was anniversary. October 2017. Wow. Okay. So there you go. You can watch athletics transitioning to business right there in front of you on this snapshot from Shark Tank. Let's play it. What's up, Sharks? My name is Chris. I'm from Dallas, Texas. Yeah. And my company is Ice Shaker. I'm here seeking $100,000 for 10% ownership in my company. Sharks, as you can tell, I work out. <laughs> Growing up in a family of five boys, being the shortest meant I had to be the strongest. Anyone that hits the gym knows what a shaker bottle is all about, and I was no exception. I had cabinets full of them. They were all exactly the same. A cheap, plastic, uninsulated bottle that would either leak, break, or smell awful after a couple months. So I fixed all these problems. Introducing the Ice Shaker. The Ice Shaker is a double wall, vacuum insulated shaker bottle that will hold ice for over 30 hours in a 75 degree room. The insulated bottle does not sweat. And here's my favorite part. The Ice Shaker is a kitchen grade stainless steel, so it doesn't absorb odor. So here today with me, to help demonstrate the product are some people you might recognize. Bros! Oh Lord. There goes the whole set. <laughs> Sharks, wow. Wow. me and my brothers, Gordy, Dan, Rob, and Glenn Gronkowski. Wow. Together, oh my God. we are the Gronks! Wow. <laughs> Sharks, after a good, hard pump session, we'd like to get hydrated, and we'd like to drink protein shakes. And the Gronk way of getting this done is with a game of Flip Cup. Today, we're playing for the Shark Tank Ice Shaker Championship Cup. Now, the rules are easy. The first team to drink the water in the cup and flip the cup over wins. And the losers, well, they got to drink a warm shake out of one of the cheap plastic sweaty <laughs> bottles over there. Oh, oh, oh. Today, we're playing five on five. Oh, no. Versus us. Oh, my God. He's taking his shirt off. I didn't know what involved us. This is scary. <laughs> what up, big dog? <laughs> Mark, what's up, buddy? How you doing? How you doing, man? That's me. Yeah, man. Congrats, champ. Good to see you, man. Hello. Good to see you, Rob. How you doing? What's up? What are the rules again? What are we doing? Okay. So, after you drink the water, you flip the cup over. Once it lands upside down like that, then the next person could drink it and start. <laughs> and then it's a relay from this point on. Okay. We ready? Then, okay. One. Here we go. Cheers. Go. 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 Chug it out. Go. Chug. Go. Go. Chug. 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 Oh, 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 Yeah, there you go. Just 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 go. Yeah! Chris, I want to know if, whether they really drank from that warm protein plastic bottle. They never did. They kind of oh. just walked away. I don't, I don't know what was up with that. <laughs> I was waiting for it. And you tell us the rest of that story. Did you eventually sign? Yeah, for yeah. sure. So we um, ended up getting offers from all five sharks. We closed the deal with Mark and Alex Rodriguez. Awesome, awesome. And that's in a way like that's business, right? You took a problem, you noticed a problem in the industry, and then you turned it into a product, right? 
Yeah, I just saw an opportunity and um, it kind of goes back to passion as well. I was just, I was all about going to the gym, working out. Uh, my dad's been in the fitness industry for 32 years now. I grew up delivering fitness equipment, mm -hmm. uh, driving the trucks for him. So I wanted to get back into that space and this was my opportunity to do so. What was probably the most pivotal skill you think that you carried over from sports into your entrepreneurial journey? Oh, I, I would just say, I would probably say just, I was so used to the hard work, mm. like the, the grind that I was probably putting a hundred hours a weekend easily. I was working Saturdays and Sundays, but it just, it felt normal at that point. So I, I say for an entrepreneur, that's kind of what you have to do uh, to get things started. Absolutely. What about you, Arena? What was kind of, what would you say is the one skill that's been crucial to you to kill you from tennis? Um, I would say resilience. I think it kind of goes with what Chris said. Um, just being able to work a lot. I mean, it, it gets to a point that I'm, I'm thinking, I need to shut down my computer and just do something different than work. I think that's just kind of, it helps a lot. Um, but just working all the time is not really good. But it, it, it helps. It really does help. Absolutely. Let us know, for those of you in the audience also that were former athletes or anything that you've played, what was one skill that you found carried over from your sporting days to your business career? And Natasha, for you, what would that skill be? I think uh, self-discipline, mm -hmm. um, especially in an individual sport, I'm sure mm -hmm. Arena can um, attest to is, you know, you're out there a lot of times on your own on the court or out on the golf course, right? And so um, being able to, you know, stick it in there and be able to keep going when maybe it's cold or rainy and you don't mm -hmm. want to be out playing, um, that sense of self-discipline. And the same thing goes back um, to business, especially through the pandemic and working remotely and being from home. I think it's easy to get very flexible with your schedule and um, maybe take a long lunch or you know not maybe get to your computer till a little bit later. So that sense of self-discipline to go and get the job done has been something that translated from golf to my business career. Got it. Now oh, <laughs> we have Brad in the audience. He says, for those of you that missed the audio earlier, they said what you couldn't hear was that all three guests at the Dallas Cowboys were going to go 17 and 0 and win the Super Bowl. So you missed that part. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, Chris, what shocked you when you went into the business world? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, I guess I would say the biggest thing I noticed almost immediately is that once you go in the business world, it's not like sports where everyone's there for the same reason. Mm. Uh, when you're in a locker room, the guys are in there to win a game. Everyone's on the same page. Everyone's all in trying to win. When you go into the business world, a lot of times people are just there just to make a paycheck. Mm -hmm. They're there just to get through the day. So you have to find a way to motivate people and get everybody on the same page. And that was, uh, I guess to me, just growing up playing sports, always working hard. I, you know, I kind of thought that that's what everyone did, but mm. you find out quickly it's not the case. Did you find that when you were hiring people for your business, did you seek that passion in them as well? Um, I was pretty terrible at hiring. I can mm. tell you that. Uh, I've learned a lot since I started. We're in year six now, but um, I like hiring athletes because mm -hmm. you, you know that they, they know what the hard work is like and, and they know how to put that time in. So that's something I definitely look for. But I, I can tell you I'm still not good at hiring. It's wow. still, it's yeah. a challenge to, yeah, everyone's going to tell you everything you want to hear right. on their job interview. So it's hard to uh, kind of distinguish that. And I think what you have to do is have the right processes and, and everything in place for that person when they first start and you have to let them have the tools to succeed or they're not going to succeed either way so I think a lot of it is more of stuff that's on you as a business owner than it is necessarily on the person that you're bringing in because you could teach people a lot the learning never stops does it <laughs> for sure so you gotta yeah you gotta a lot of it I put on myself and yeah. I think I can always do a better job and when I do I see the results absolutely and you, Arena, what shocked you when you went into the business world, in this case, corporate world, right? Yeah, um, I think it's the fact that I was never really physically tired. However, I was just so mentally tired. It's such a big transition because, of course, it's, mental is so big when it comes to sports, but it's more focused on the physical part. Your body is the one that's taking the beating, let's say. Mm -hmm. So whenever you, I started working, 
I was so confused. I would get home and I'm just so like tired, but I'm not ready to go to sleep. I'm just like, I feel exhausted mentally, um, which it took a little while until I got used to the feeling. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of, that was my biggest thing, I think. Got it. We have Chris O'Connor in the audience telling myself, you can do this. Don't stop because others say you can't do it. I mean, definitely ties into all the things that we're talking about here. And you, Natasha, what, what shocked you going into, you went from, yeah, golfing to car nerd to Capgemini and <laughs> Amazon, all these big names. Was there something that really surprised you? Yeah, uh, going into technology is a field that I had absolutely no idea what it was and it was completely foreign to me. And so the sense of imposter syndrome was a massive surprise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being a golfer, I was very secure in who I was and, and knew, you know, all of these things that I was involved in and going into IT um, was, was very different. Um, but what I loved about it was kind of like Irina, you were saying, I, I loved school, I loved taking mm -hmm. exams, I loved learning. And so going into a field where I did get the opportunity to learn something completely new and the amount of people who were willing to give me the opportunity to go and learn something new was, was equally as uh, you know, shocking as it was welcomed and, and surprising mm -hmm. as well, so. And I think people recognize that, like, I mean, sports is so much into every thread and fabric of our life now and they, they realize if you can succeed in sports that kind of those skills can translate to the business world right absolutely mm -hmm. yeah now sports and everyday life right how do you kind of see it both at home and as well as at work you know even in like the conference rooms or the water cooler conversations sports just kind of like weaves in and it connects us right have you seen that as you kind of go about your career and your business chris um you're able to kind of bring up sports and have that connect people and connect community absolutely i mean it's it's a a way to open a door for me for sure mm -hmm. uh the nfl connection especially if it's a team they like uh it's going to get me it's going to get me a call it's going to get me a meeting uh it's going to at least get me um, a response which is right what you need in business. Business is so much about just networking, knowing the right people, uh, and that's really what it helps you grow and takes you to that next level. So uh, for me, it's been, it's been huge. It's been a huge blessing to be able to have that sports connection. And then everyone has a favorite team, uh, yeah. a favorite sport, and I, I try to, I mean, I definitely use it to my advantage. People talking smack in the oh, they, A lot of people, right? that, that works too. Yeah, a lot of people, it, talking smack still starts that conversation, so. Yep. Uh, yeah. I, I respect the, the smack talk as well. Got it, <laughs> got it. Have you seen, you know, how has tennis kind of opened doors for you or like in conversations or just meeting people? Do you find it connects and kind of is a good conversation starter? Well, tennis brought me to CG Hour. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about that. Yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. Just, <laughs> absolutely. Um, networking is so important in pretty much any business mm -hmm. or industry. And for us in IT, that is such a big connection. Like, you know, everybody, yeah. whether they play professionally or just collegiate or just for fun, like, you know, when you bring up the fact that you are a student athlete or just like a professional athlete and you play tennis, golf, football, whatever, there's always something to talk about. Mm -hmm. A lot of people know at least something about one sport. There's very few people that are not really watching sports or anything. So it's just such a big point of connection and kind of like conversation started. Absolutely. And they always say businesses, deals are struck on the golf course, yeah. right? <laughs> Have you seen evidence of that or is it kind of like a Hollywood myth? Um, in my experience, it's been a little bit of a myth, I have to mm -hmm. say. I don't, you know, I don't go out. I haven't had the opportunity to go out with too much with my customers yet, but I will mm -hmm. say, um, you would like kick all their, yeah. <laughs> their rears, right? <laughs> what do they say? Don't beat your boss, right? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, very similar answers in that it, it does help you network a lot, um, help build a sense of community. But, you know, I will say in my experience too, there are, um, especially in my field where, um, maybe the woman to male ratio isn't necessarily the same all the time. And yeah. particularly in sales where, um, you may not have, um, be on the same sort of level as some of these executives that you're working with and so it's interesting to me how many times the conversation has shifted once they realize that maybe you know that i was a, a golfer beforehand mm -hmm. um so it's to, to your point i've definitely taken advantage of the fact that um i've you know was an athlete and yeah. it has opened doors 
Absolutely. Um, speaking of technology, we wanted to run this next event promo by you, the Alliance of Technology and Women. Um, we have an event that we're helping to promote. CG Infinity is a proud sponsor of DFW ATW. So let's roll that video right now. Hello, my name is Aries Webb Williams, and I'm the president of DFW Alliance of Technology and Women. We are a nonprofit that is committed to increasing the number of women in leadership and strengthening the pipeline of girls entering technology fields. I'm inviting you to our 2022 Executive Leadership Forum. And this year, we are excited because our fundraiser will be September 8th at the National Soccer Hall of Fame in Frisco, Texas. And man, we have a powerhouse group of women. We have our MC, Marissa Horn, She's the Vice President of Technology, Strategy, and Governance, Financial Services at Capital One. Our keynote this year is Lisa Gable. She's a Wall Street Journal and USA Today bestselling author of Turn Around, How to Change Course When Things Are Going South. Our fireside chat this year is with Nina Vaca. She is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Pinnacle Group, a global workforce solutions provider twice named the fastest growing a woman owned company in the country. This year's theme is stand in your power. And these ladies clearly have. I'm excited to share the stage with them as we celebrate our 20th year anniversary. And as a 100% volunteer organization, this event is a vital fundraiser that we hope will draw new partners into the fold. The funds we raise will support our programs such as Ignite, which is an upskilling and reskilling program for women in tech, and I Lead in STEM, which is a scholarship-based program that introduces girls to science and technology fields. All in all, the forum will feature a VIP cocktail hour and auction at 4.30 p.m. and, a li and live music by saxophonist Charmin Green and her band. The doors will open to all ticket holders at 4.30 p.m. and tax deductible sponsorships are also available, including the opportunity to select a spokesperson from your organization to moderate the event's fireside chat. If you need more information, please contact sponsorships at dfwatw.org. And to register, please visit dfwatw.org forward slash meeting. I can't wait to see you there. So shout out to our friend out there, Aries Webb Williams. Be sure to register for that amazing event, which will be held at the uh, National Soccer Hall of Fame. So you see, again, the sports theme just carries through in so many things in our lives. I want to shift a little bit now, and for those of you in the audience as well, kind of think of a loss that you've had in your sporting career. And um, I mean, we for every game we play, there's winners, and then there's people that don't win and fail or lose. What has all that taught you? Natasha, you want to start us off? Yeah. Um... I think that you have to learn to, fold, you have to fall down to be able to learn how to get back up, right? And so um, I, I tend to be a little bit of a perfectionist and um, it's, it's hard sometimes to not get, you know, for things to not go my way and, and definitely lose a match for sure. Um, but I think that for me, it's always kind of an opportunity to uh, look back and understand, you know, maybe why without emotion um, and an opportunity to learn. Um, I think it's really taught me to be vocally self-critical um, in a way that I don't beat myself up over it. Um, and, and again, gives me a, a, an opportunity to learn as to why maybe I lost and be able to improve as I go forward. What would be one trick to do that? Because even the other month we were talking about stress management and well-being, right? How do you turn the voice from being critical to like a learning moment. Is there a trick that you have? Oh, I wish I had a quick answer. <laughs> but, um, no, I think any loss, it just takes time. Like yeah. you've got, I think the big thing is allow 
you've got to allow yourself to get upset a little bit mm. and you know feel it and i think that's what builds the motivation to go and figure out how to fix it and get better so um i think a lot of times you know you focus on not maybe feeling the grief of it or being upset about it but i think you do have to learn how to lose um mm. and then figure out that helps you figure out how to get better um, and improve going forward got it now chris you guys play on teams, millions of people watch you win and lose. How do you deal with that when, when it's a devastating loss and you're at the, you know, at a game and it was so critical? I mean, it's definitely tough. Uh, it is, a, it's a game, uh, a, a team game though. So it is a little bit different than an individual sport. So uh, to me, every play is kind of a battle and you know, you try to do your best to win. I think if you show up, you're prepared, you do what you set out to do. You know, it's it's still a win for you, but there's times that you can go back and learn more and get better prepared. But overall, as a team sport, it's it's hard to sit there and just point it down to one thing because mm -hmm. there's so many variables as a team. I think it's more of just coming together after a loss as a team and still supporting everyone, working together, staying together, and that's when you get a team that wins mm -hmm. when they bounce back as a team together and then step it up to that next level. Absolutely. What about you, Irina? What's been your experience? I think I always said that losing teaches you more than succeeding, mm. like, you know, winning in a tennis match or sports in general. I, you, you tend to think, where did, what did I do wrong? Where can I improve? Um, you always, as an athlete, you're always going to be motivated to improve yourself because, you know, at the end of the day, you want to win regardless of the situation. So, but there are so many pieces that go into a tennis match or or any sport for that matter. Um, so you got to look at every little thing and kind of adjust what is most important and what would make a big difference. Absolutely. Now, I'm a parent. I'm a mom of two kids. There's tons of people in our audience that are parents. We put our kids through all kinds of sporting events, soccer, little league, golf, football. like. It is, especially in Texas, sports is such a big part of our upbringing. Um, and at the same time, they have to balance academics, they have to balance work and schoolwork and grades. What have you kind of seen as, is there a balance? Like Chris, maybe we start with you. Like we're such a, we're in Texas, it's such a big football kind of Friday night lights, right? For, for high schools, how do you balance that? for like lessons for parents and for kids. I, I mean, I thought that was a skill that you learn as an athlete that helps you later on in life as well in the business world too. As an athlete, I mean, it's a full-time job, especially in college, and you're also a full-time student. So uh, just being able to manage all that prepares you for life for sure. So, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't think you should sit there and train all day, every day. You know, I think there's a balance there where you need to rest. Uh, you need to give yourself physically and mentally uh, prepared by doing the work, but also by resting and, and recovering. But uh, overall, I think the multitasking as an athlete prepares you for, for life. What would be your one piece of advice for parents raising kids? Because your parents raised five athletes. Five boys. <laughs> five boys, and I got four now. I got three boys and, oh, and just had yeah. a girl. So uh, as a parent, I would say that's tough. Uh, you got to, I'm looking back at my parents, uh, you got to give yourself some, some uh, time for yourself as well, mm. is what I would say for my mom, because my mom was like nonstop, <laughs> every day, getting us ready for school, bringing us to multiple practices, five boys. I mean, it was literally like she was running a full-time business because she had to get us all to practice and it was physically impossible. She had to oh. coordinate it with coaches, with neighbors. And she did all this without a cell phone, which was like the craziest thing ever to me and without GPS. <laughs> um, so talking to her and like, as I get older, I have so much respect for my parents. And the one thing that she would always say is like, yeah, I wish I took a little bit more time for myself at some point. Mm -hmm. And you, Natasha, since six years old, right? You're playing golf. Um, and what did your parents say to you to keep you motivated and how did they balance, how did you balance things with your schoolwork and all that? Yeah, early on, it was very much 50-50 in my family, right? Mm -hmm. My mom was adamant that 
school was just as important as golf because you never know if you're going to get injured or if it doesn't work out. And when I went to college and played uh, D1 golf, you know, it wasn't lost on me that I was fortunate enough to have a free education. Um, mm -hmm. And that wasn't an opportunity that I was going to give up on, right? So for me, I think for, for everybody, it's, it's personal preference. And I think that just depends on your situation. But definitely for me, it was very much um, a 50-50 balance between school and, and playing. And do you know when to push versus when to support or challenge versus like they're there or mm -hmm. like you can do this? Like, is there a fine line there or any advice that you would give to parents on that? Yeah, advice I would give, um, you know, I think when you're competing at that level, it very quickly becomes like a job. Mm. Um, and so my advice to parents would be, you know, let them fall in love with the game. Learn about the history, learn about the greatest comeback stories, find heroes early. And I think that's what gets you through the quiet moments on the golf course when you're training or you need to, you know, really grit your teeth and get something done. And that helps build that real passion in your heart for the game. And it's not just making sure that you're technically sound. I think it helps build a love for the game that you're playing. Great advice. I love that, learning about the history too, yeah. where it came from. I like that. For those of you parents out there, share your best tip on juggling all those sporting events and things with your kids. What has worked for you? Um, and Irina, what about you? Juggling it all and um, what did your, did your parents say anything to you in particular to kind of get you through the hard times? Um, I think when I was traveling a lot, like I used to travel with one of my parents, either my mom or my dad, and my dad acted like my coach a lot of the times. So I think um, it was always, they used to always push me. And my mom was very, my mom found school and education very important. So she always had to push me, make sure that there is a balance because when you travel so much, you skip school a lot and you know especially as a teenager and all that so she made sure that she pushes me to study while i'm on the road as well um but i think one thing that i would say parents should do is the fact that whenever the kid comes home from playing sports or so you got to remember you're not their coach like you still their parent like it's not always like don't make the sport necessarily the most important the kid has to be motivated to play and when i say the kid it can be any age like you know the player the athlete got to be motivated to actually um want to go play and practice and everything because at the end of the day when he get or she gets home like they just want the compassion of the parents mm -hmm. you know like yeah. oh he did a great job today yeah <laughs> for sure um, our, one of our audience members, David Ball, he says, I believe our children are taught by society to do less physically uh, activities through devices. Making them be active physically suits them and can be part of their daily life. That's for sure. My son's up, upstairs in the media room playing video games and I'm like, get out, <laughs> <laughs> go play outside. Um, as we kind of wrap up the show, I we, Think back to last month's episode where we talked about well-being and stress management and incorporating fitness into our life. Um, is there one last piece of advice of how you kind of stay mentally, physically fit that you'd like to share with our audience? Natasha, you want to kick us um, off? Yeah, I, I, I love to work out. Um, I love to go to the gym. I'm, I'm battling a back injury at the moment. Mm -hmm. so, at, so right now, I'm just very grateful to be able to be on my feet and be able to yeah. move. So, you know, we're here in DFW. It's finally going to start cooling down. Mm -hmm. So my advice would be just get outside, throw on a pair of headphones, and go for a walk. Um, enjoy the sunshine. Love it. Chris, what about you? Uh, I'm the same way. I start pretty much every morning with a workout um, at the gym. I want to take care of myself so I can take care of everyone else during the day. So I also like to challenge myself in the morning. I feel like it's a good way to physically uh, challenge myself so that mentally I'm kind of ready for the rest of the day, get that stress out and get ready to go. So uh, my advice is get up, get to the gym or do some kind of activity uh, that you enjoy doing at least three to four times a week. Start your day from there. That's how I do it. Got it. Irina, what about you? I am a big walker. I wake mm. up in the morning, make sure, you know, like we mentioned, it's so hot in Texas right now. So I would wake up at seven o'clock and just go for like an hour, an hour and a half walk. It's just, you know, like the nature and the sun helps with your mental too. Like it puts me in a good mood. 
and then just, you know, just sweating a little bit. It always gets the day started really well. I love it. All of you out there, share with us your fitness tip or your mental, physical health tip, and let's spread that message across all our platforms. Um, and as we kind of close out, I want to thank CG Infinity, who is the sponsor of the show. Uh, they had an open house last month, so we wanted to play for you a bit of playback and summary of that. Let's roll Welcome that. Speaking of heat, I want to introduce to you the topic that will be the next month's topic. Actually, we're going to be skipping September. We are actually going to have our next show on October 12th. And that's going to be all about how the grid survived this summer, uh, all around retail energy and how we're going, hopefully, not going into another ice storm this winter and losing our power. So that will be the topic of the October CG Hour. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Before I go, I was promised something called the Muscle Chug <laughs> <laughs> by Chris Gronkowski. We want right a demonstration, Chris. All right, all right. Last time I was in studio, this is how it's done. So <laughs> the whole purpose is you're supposed to be flexing as you're chugging. So. You oh, don't we put actually it on the muscle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right here. There you go. Oh, there now you're so in the put shot. it on the forearm, and then you flex as you drink it. So. <laughs> there you go, folks. Make sure. Try it out at home. <laughs> Get that ice shaker and uh, stay cool. Build in fitness to your life. And as we always say, people first, driven to transform. See you next time, everyone. Thank you, everyone.